Welcome to Dateline Health. This is Fred Lippman coming to you from Nova Southeastern University. And uh, we had a show all about a year and a half ago plus uh, talking about something called telehealth. And uh, the reason why that some of you have been asking to get back to it is because you see so much discussion on television and uh, in the various media outlets. So I figured I'm going to bring back the experts. So I bring the experts. Here we go. I have in front of me uh, Dr. Deborah Mulligan, uh, who is, she's got all kinds of acronyms after her name, and she'll explain what she is. But she's the director of the Child Health Policy Institute here at Nova Southeastern University, and also a, a professor in pediatrics and also a very prominent uh, pediatric physician. Welcome, Dr. Mulligan. Thank you. Good to have you. Thank yeah. you. I'm happy to be back. Good. And we have a, a newcomer to us, but not a newcomer from her place of employment, and that's Leslie Gross, a nurse professional. We love nurse professionals around here. And uh, you are the Assistant Vice President for Operations of the Telehealth Center in Baptist Health of South Florida. Welcome, Leslie. Thank you. Good to have you here. Thank you. Tell us about, uh, we, we did have a show when uh, the, the telehealth center was being created, <coughs> mm -hmm. and uh, you were about to uh, sign agreements with various entities around the state of Florida. So give us some update, and, or tell the folks what the telehealth center is all about at Baptist Health Center, otherwise known as Baptist Hospital. Well, we've been in the telehealth field for about 10 years. We have a remote ICU that monitors 150 of our sickest patients in the health system. We cover six hospitals, 20 urgent cares um, in the greater Miami area. We have several telehealth programs. We provide telestroke to our outreach hospitals and a telestroke program to our mother hospital uh, to expedite times and take care of patients in a more timely manner. We visit the home via telemedicine. Uh, we remote monitor uh, patients via telemedicine. We are on the cruise lines um, with uh, behavioral health and crisis intervention. And we do e-primary care visits and urgent care visits via telehealth. Okay. Dr. Bulligan, I know that you've been uh, one of the, uh, I want to say, pioneers in the field of telehealth through your activities with the National Associations mm -hmm. dealing with uh, pediatric health, mm -hmm. uh, particularly, uh, and I got to mention that uh, I think it's important that you are the, uh, the I want to say, president of the Florida Pediatric Society, which mm -hmm. uh, and you were the first female person to yes. be the president <laughs> of that. <coughs> We were very, very proud. Now, this is a few years ago, but I won't say how many years ago. No, no. No, 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 don't say that. <laughs> but, uh, but you are very, very proactive, and I stay in touch with all of our leaders within mm -hmm. that group. Mm -hmm. uh, I, in fact, I, I, I spoke with uh, the leader of leaders, Dr. Gerald Sheba, just uh, a week ago. He's the best. And, and he asked about my, uh, his dear, as he said, his dear Dr. Deb. Did he? Yes, Aww. he did. So, but tell, <laughs> us, really tell nice. us about your involvement in sure. telehealth. Well, first I want to acknowledge you because you're on the Florida Tax Watch Board of Advisors and they are a driving force in the state of Florida. With We met actually a couple of years ago because we were both presenting at their telehealth summit. So um, I, I want the audience to know that you're very much involved too. And uh, you know, telehealth to me, since I've always been in trauma centers for all my life, is very exciting new frontier for healthcare that in the next few years is just going to become another tool, another modality that's integrated, just as you're talking about, within the healthcare systems. But right now, you would want to know what's driving it. Why is it so exciting? Why are people talking about it? And then why are people predicting that within five years it's going to be a $13 billion industry? Well, pretty straightforward. One, uh, healthcare costs are rising. It's very difficult to be able to provide good quality care at high standards and be cost effective. Geriatric population, there's a lot of folks with chronic disease management that require a whole team of caseworkers, which you alluded to, you provide at, at Baptist. There's technologies available. It's here, it's now, it's here on our campus at NSU. And we're really fortunate that we've galvanized a group of deans that are gonna be looking at how we will provide telemedicine with our different um, 
divisions. And then lastly, it's direct-to-consumer demand. I mean, think about the generations. Baby boomers, I want a face-to-face. -face. I really want to know you as my doctor. And then the next generation, it would be uh, Generation X. I like my cell phone, I like emails. The next generation, millennials, they're all about social media. How can I get to you through my apps and so forth? And then we have our pediatric population, which are the millennials. And they're all about uh, privacy. How do I have a paperless trail? How do I communicate everything on my screen? Well, if you look at post-Obamacare and the obligation on us providers to make sure that we take on higher risk, to sustain wellness in our patient population, and then you look at those generations, how are you possibly going to engage the millennials unless you meet them where they are? And that's why telehealth is booming, because it addresses all of those areas. So to your good point, uh, I'm one of the authors of the American Telemedicine Association Primary Care Urgent Care Standards. We just finished writing school health and pediatric standards, which were approved by the American Academy of Pediatrics, which I'm really excited about. And um, you know, I can probably go on and on, but you'll want to stop me. No, because <laughs> I get so we're excited not, we're about not gonna it. Let you, we're not going to stop you. We're just going to let Leslie get in on this. <laughs> sure, there have been uh, a lot of resistance at the beginning, um, but once you set forth and go forward, there's so many unbelievable moments that telemedicine has provided uh, instant help to that that you win everyone over very very quickly. Uh, so many hallmark, I call them the hallmark moments. Um, we service the Keys area. We have a hospital in the Keys, which is a very remote area, not accessible to a lot of health care. Uh, a gentleman came in very, very ill. He was a physician, a retired physician, a very slow heart rate. The physician on really didn't know what to do, but he needed to transfer him out. He couldn't transfer him because he wasn't stable enough to go anywhere. <clears throat> and a team of doctors via telehealth medicine, um, right from our critical care unit and, and our, our cardiology unit, were able to, to figure out this problem that that poor physician all by himself in the Keys needed some assistance with. Um, and it was, uh, it was such a very memorable moment because after everything was stabilized and we were able to fly him out, he looked straight at that camera and he said, see ya, <laughs> thanks. I mean, just invaluable things. Telestroke, time is of the essence, time is brain. Mm -hmm. You instantly access your neurologist who can make decisions instantly. You know, it takes time for patients to get to the hospital. You eat up valuable three hours of time just making your decision to go, to not to go, and then you get there and to work through the maze of the hospital, that brings so much to the patient instantly. And people like accessibility. You know, it's hard to access the systems and they don't want to waste their time if they need rechecks, wound checks, uh, a burn recheck. You don't have to inconvenience yourself. They are very appreciative that we're able to offer that service. Let me ask a question. I'm sure, that, or maybe I'm, 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 I'm going to ask you, but I would assume that the Baptist Health System has a certified stroke center. Correct. Correct. The application of what you're saying, I would assume, enables the, that same physician group that in the Keys who might have had a stroke patient, correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. And you would garner all of the people in those instantly groupings. Instantly, we have processes worked out, and everyone is, you know, uh, connected, and they can make decisions. Well, the the reason why we as people were asking us questions, it really emanated out of the the, sh the show that where we had the firefighter paramedics here, and they were interested in. Well, how, how, what happens if, you know, I'm someplace else? Well, let's look at, uh, you mentioned <clears throat> access. And looking at those underserved areas, because, of course, NSU is an AHEC. <clears throat> and we look at those rural communities that are many counties that we're responsible for. When you look at research from the federal government, there are 15,000 deficiencies or, or shortage of primary care providers, dental providers, and mental health providers. There are 80 million, 80 million people living in those communities with no access to mental health. So when you talk about access, one, there's the 
you know, lights, buzzers, whistles of EMS and stroke, but there's also the day-to-day -day operations. How do those people get access to behavioral health? How do those people get access to sustaining wellness when they have diabetes and they can't drive an hour and a half from their farm to wherever? Or even people who are underserved in the middle of an urban environment. There are people who can't get transportation. So all of them deserve to have good health care uh, provided to them. And many people want to know about reimbursement, and we haven't touched on that yet. So if I stay with the government sort of perspective of the underserved and um, what can be done through government supported reimbursement, number one, 40, let's see, it's 48 states um, have some form of coverage for telemedicine through Medicaid. There are 29 states in the District of Columbia that require the private insurance companies to pay for telemedicine on par with an office visit. Our own Senator Nelson is very active with uh, the legislation that's being carried. It's bipartisan in Congress right now. It's led by Senator Schatz from Hawaii. It's called Connect to Health and Senator Wicker from Mississippi. And it will effectively remove some of the barriers that exist right now to be able to have further coverage of telemedicine with Medicare, uh, specifically with the merit-based uh, performance uh, to, for providers. Right now though, even having said that, Medicare has increased payments, even last year, it's up 25%. It's hovering around 18 million in uh, payments for telemedicine, which is why we think this is gonna really pass, because they see the value in it, they see the utility in being able to manage patients in a variety of ways that we've already discussed. In addition, I uh, was going to share with you that I want your audience to know some really cool, uh, cool news, and that is the Department of Defense has approved as of uh, February that military families can receive telemedicine benefits at home or in other facilities. So again, you know, the government is moving forward because they see this is a wonderful way to provide access to quality, high standard health care for all age groups. And, and really, to both of you, uh, the issue, and I, I don't want the issue of providing health care only for those people who don't have health care right, right. To, to be construed as uh, this is another element of government trying to help people that yeah. only don't have, you know, have coverage. The reality is, and the reason why Tax Watch has been actively involved in this, is because as a basic composite group of people who are corporate uh, advocates for right. the betterment of a community, <clears throat> right. as well as education advocates and others, uh, they want to see greater efficiency in the delivering of health care. And they also recognize that here, for example, in the state of Florida, that we have this tremendous disparity of availability of health care services. We have a doctor shortage, we have a nurse shortage, we have uh, in, in certain areas we have pharmacy shortage, we have uh, mental, uh, health. Particular, well, mental health, is, clearly it's been a mental health shortage for years. And the people out here that have been asking questions really were enticed to listen to this because they, they wanted to know, well, how, do, how does technology help me? Right. And, and, and I really think that, that the reason that Baptists got into this is to make sure that instead of just building more bricks and mortar buildings and looking for the people to fill up those buildings, which we already know we have a shortage of, that you've, that you've invested a lot of your knowledge and your skill capabilities and applied it to creation of a telehealth center. Is that correct? Correct. The monitoring your ICU patients is a perfect example of that. There's a huge shortage of intensivists, and those are the doctors that cover your ICU beds. And now we can centrally localize a physician who can oversee all of those patients who all they need is his cognitive skills, the, the skills we can provide at the bedside. And it's instantly, um, they respond first to all of their codes, um, it's great utilization of resources and the, you know with one of the things that telehealth brings about that we sometimes forget when hospitals doctors are in hospitals there's a lot of things to deal with a lot of things come at you a lot of people you're getting undivided attention 
when you're really doing a telehealth visit, which sometimes <coughs> people don't really ever put into the equation. No nurses pulling you away, no family members pulling you away. So things are able to be done very focused, very quickly, very precisely. Um, and it's such a great way to use your resources. I mean, to, to have doctors 24-7 at the bedside versus having them in one central location to be able to oversee six hospitals, you can only imagine the cost savings that occur with that. Well, you know, again, going back to some of the conversations I've had with Tax Watch uh, fellow board members, uh, I would say that uh, the interest is such because, you know, we have such an interesting state when it comes to the mass of the state. People don't realize how large we are relative to mm -hmm. land mass. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, we're the third largest population state in the Union, but, you know, we have a lot of land mass. For example, you go from Homestead, Florida, which is at the top of the Keys, and you go to Pensacola, Florida, you're halfway to Chicago, I mean, in, in mileage. So uh, the, the, the issue really to them, or to the people that I've communicated with, is that how do we bring health care benefit, I'm talking about not the payment of, but the benefit of cognitive health care, of applied knowledge to all the people that can't get to their physicians. Can't, the mom can't, who has a child with 103 temperature, all of a sudden spikes and, doesn't, and has to go to a pediatrician and has to drive 60 miles. Mm -hmm. Telehealth, to me, is an answer. It gives efficiency, <coughs> cost benefit, but more importantly, it, pre it presents health care to the patient. Dr. Deborah. Uh, if I could touch on two really important issues that I heard you raise. One is the change in education and training for physicians. So the American Medical Association, by example, has 32 medical schools that are part of a consortium that are rewriting medical education with the idea of it being innovative. It incorporates telemedicine. Right now you understand that every medical student and resident coming out of training is going to incorporate telemedicine as a tool they will use to manage their patients wherever they practice. Number two, you touched upon industry. And you're right, you know, em employers are in a seemingly uh, unwinnable situation. Healthcare costs are going up. Employer insurance coverage for their employees is going up. They want their patients, excuse me, their employees to be healthy, happy persons. That is invaluable to have a strong, healthy workforce. So of course they're going to invest, and but they have to find a way to invest that's going to be manageable. So it's not surprising at all that 70% of all companies, medium, small, large, in this country offer some form of telehealth benefit right now. And it doesn't surprise you then to know that the majority of insurance companies, you see the really funny commercial from United Health with a uh, woman leaping across to jump on her husband and the table crashes and they go to the telehealth doctor to find out if they need to go in to see a doctor in person or not. But my point remaining that the majority of industry is covering telehealth at some manner right now. So it's not just the government, it's the private insurers, it's the employer groups, and that's because they see it, as you said, an integral part of the overall health care. Leslie Gross, uh, the Baptist uh, Telehealth Center uh, was an initiative that some incredibly innovative thinkers decided would be of value, not only to your system, but more importantly to the people that you serve. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about that. Well, um, like you said, it, it did come from the very top. Uh, one of our CEOs had read an article about monitoring ICU patients in the town that he grew up in, and he said, you know what, we need to have this. And he brought it to the table, and we started the research, and like I said, that was more than 10 years ago. And from that point, um, we have decreased mortality by about 25 percent. We've in decreased length of stay by about 28%, but that equates to lives saved. People that were predicted to die are now walking out of the hospital and having much better outcomes. Because not only with telehealth do you get instant medicine, but you get analytics behind it that run differently, smart, intuitive software mm -hmm. that also telehealth is able to bring to the table, which has well, been very invaluable. 
telehealth, bottom line, is created to help these people out here to have a better life expectancy and to have a better way of mm -hmm. living a healthy life. Mm -hmm. And to make bring medicine to you more patient-centered and bring access to the patients. You, you have urban cities that have, have physicians, but you have elderly people, you have pediatric patients, you have working, working parents. All of those things come into play and are very important to people. Dr. Deborah Mulligan? I love it. As you know, I've um, managed thousands of patients using telemedicine, both in the academic center, in the trauma center, and in their home. And it's, a, it's fun to be able to see the child with the parent in their home, understand the environment that they're living in, being able to provide speech therapy or occupational therapy to someone who can't get to the facility easily without a big lift to get there. There's just such a spectrum, as you've covered here, between at-home care for minor illnesses all the way out to complex critical care, saving people's lives in remote areas or even in the urban setting. It's just, it's a fantastic tool. No question about it. And, and you know, uh, being very, I guess you'd say, very well involved with, as you know, with trauma issues and trauma care, and people don't understand why we don't have trauma centers on every corner, which is impossible because of the composite nature of what you have to put into a trauma center. However, with telehealth, you bring trauma centers into the facility, into the home, into the doctor's Wherever's office. Wherever's needed. Is that true? Absolutely. It's a patient-centered adjunct right. to medicine. And of course you, Dr. Mulligan, <laughs> as a pediatric trauma uh, practitioner, uh, I would assume that it's a tremendous opportunity and boon to save little children's lives. On a, truly, I mean, even if it's a minor illness, a drowning, the whole spectrum, once again, it's phenomenal to be able to provide high quality standards of care to anyone where they need us, whether it's at home, at school, in the employee office, wherever they might be in that moment. We can provide them with that. Uh, I will tell you that the American Academy of Pediatrics, since we're discussing uh, pediatrics right now, there's an entire innovation center now that is focused on telehealth and bringing the virtual office to all pediatric offices in the country. This is a huge push from the new CEO who was once medical director for Anthem prior to this job and who worked closely with American Well, one of the four companies that are out there. And she understands that we pediatricians, the 63,000 members, need to get on the bandwagon and figure out how it integrates into our lives to take care of our beautiful patients and their families. You know, I, just very quickly, I, I, I just got notice uh, that the state of New York has gone to uh, uh, electronic Processing for prescriptions. In other words, yes. no more, no more, That's no right. more writing That's of right. prescriptions. No more paper. March thirty first. And the reason why they're doing it, it now obviously politically they did it to control the overutilization of opioids and you know narcotics and things of that nature. But the reality is, is that what this will do is it'll also monitor patient use, mm -hmm. it enable the pharmacists and the people who are dispensing to have therapeutic management mm -hmm. of the patient to make sure that, oh, you didn't take your, your uh, high blood pressure pills this month, something's wrong, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, there's a lot of applications to make these folks' lives better without interfering with them, but yet knowing that you have the cognitive knowledge as professionals to bring to them and I see there's an application, I think there's a correlation mm -hmm. between what New York and Minnesota just did no question. That, to really telehealth. Am I right? Absolutely. No Absolutely. question. And there's, again, why, why would the American Telemedicine Association be having its annual meeting in Minnesota? Minnesota. Mm -hmm. Because Minnesota is driving a lot of interesting ways by which to provide care. But to your point earlier and what you're saying about data and being able to use big data, it's actually very positive in another way because now we can monitor ourselves, the physicians, to look at here are the disease conditions that you diagnosed. When did you prescribe 
all sorts of medicines, but in the particular, which everyone's looking at, antibiotics. Were you judicious in your choice of antibiotics? Did this person actually need antibiotics? Did it fit the guidelines for these different minor illnesses? And so in a wonderful way, we can actually uh, have peer-to-peer -peer review and, and teach each other about well, those we're things. We're down to the last 35 seconds of this show, I'm told. Well, thank you very much, Leslie Gross. We appreciate you being here. Thank you for, uh, for telling us and bringing information about Baptist Health Telehealth Center. Uh, we hope to be participatory in any which way we can through our health professions to be helpful to you and Baptist Health to uh, be a, a, uh, an efficient and uh, successful use of this product. So thank, thank you very much for being thank here. Thank you, Tim, Appreciate for having it. us. Thank you. thank you. And Dr. Deborah Mulligan, what can I say? You know, I see you on a, almost on a weekly basis. <laughs> Uh, and I want to thank you for your continued advocacy in behalf of these little beautiful children yeah. that you deal with all the time, but also with your knowledge in the vast area like telehealth. But thank you very much for being here. Folks, I hope that uh, we brought some information that will stir interest in your uh, understanding of what's about to happen uh, nationally, but more importantly, I hope we answer the questions relative to what's going on. Why are we using technology to take care of me? Well, now you've heard some of the uh, answers. Uh, and remember, this show uh, is called Dateline Health. If there's a telephone number and an email address right here, you have any questions, give us a call. And uh, as I always tell you, take good care of yourself. Yeah. So thank you very much for showing up again this week. My name is Fred Lippman. We come to you from Nova Southeastern University. Until next time, see ya.